welcome to uh, Human Islets, a an integrated uh, platform for human islet data across access and analysis with uh, doctors Patrick McDonald and Jessica Ewald. Um, just a little bit about this resource, uh, Dr. Patrick McDonald from University of Alberta and Dr. Jessica Ewald from the Broad will present Human Islets. Um, this Human Islets is a community resource in support of research in islet biology, transplantation, and diabetes. The tool brings together data sets collected through the processing, culture, quality control, and phenotyping of human research pancreas and islets processed by the Alberta Diabetes Institute, Islet Core, with analysis tools developed by the GLAB, allowing data exploration and hypothesis generation. A couple of short bios about our presenters. Uh, Dr. McDonald has been studying Patrick, uh, sorry, pancreatic islets for nearly 25 years. He completed his PhD at the University of Toronto in 2003 with Dr. Michael Wheeler, and then postdoctoral fellowships at Lund University in Sweden and University of Oxford. In 2006, he was recruited back to Canada and established his laboratory in the Department of Pharmacology and the Alberta Diabetes Institute at the University of Alberta, where he currently holds a Tier 1 Canada, uh, Canada Research Chair. He's continued to study the pancreatic islet biology and diabetes, recently through the implementation of pancreas patch seq to connect biophysical properties of cells with gene expression and the study of signal transduction pathways that control cellular excitability. He also established the Alberta Diabetes Institute Islet Core, which is a biobanking banking program that supports research by 160 groups uh, worldwide and co-funded the Canadian Islet Research and Training Network to support the pancreatic islet research community. And uh, Jessica Ewald is a Banting postdoctoral fellow in the Carpenter Singh Lab at the Broad Institute, where she's developing statistical and machine learning methods for using multi-omics data from in vitro functional genomics and chemical toxicity screens. She holds a BS in uh, Bachelor of Science in Engineering and Applied Math from Harvard and a PhD in Bioinformatics from McGill. For her thesis, she developed a suite of web-based tools for analyzing omics data, and she's passionate about maximizing the translational applications of her research, leading her to engage with memories of government and industry who wants to use systems biology approaches for chemical risk assessment and to teach courses on her software in numerous conferences, workshops, and webinar series. Thank you both so very much for joining and sharing this, uh, this really exciting resource with the scientific community uh, at large. Thanks so much, uh, Monica, and um, you know, thank you to you and to the the team of Sugar Science for hosting us today. Um, you know, I think the work that that you've done uh, to support the community is very much in line with uh, our goals uh, and some of the things that we'll talk about today. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm not going to take much time uh, introducing uh, this today. I'm going to turn it over very shortly to to Jess. Um, but uh, just as a bit of background, maybe we can go to the next slide, Jess. Um, the, the resource that we're talking about today comes out uh, largely from our work uh, isolating and characterizing human islets here in Edmonton uh, at the Alberta Diabetes Institute Islet Corps. Some of you might be familiar with this program. Um, it's a program focused solely on research pancreas and re research islets that runs uh, parallel to the clinical transplant program here in Edmonton. Uh, and our goal really is to make use of organs um, with research consent uh, that have no other uh, clinical use. So we are a last stop, if you will, uh, for uh, pancreas in Canada uh, to support uh, research and researchers. We do somewhere between 50 and 60 isolations per year, uh, and we're looking for donors, you know, as broadly as possible, young, old, with, without diabetes, and so on. Uh, we, um, just so, so the group here knows, we uh, distribute uh, islets, um, you know, all over North America and Europe and a little bit elsewhere. Um, we uh, can provide tissue beyond islets as well, uh, which are listed here, spleen, lymph nodes, so on. Uh, and we house a large bank of of frozen, uh, cryopreserved, and, and FFPE uh, islets and biopsies. So if, if you want anything from us, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. And one of the, the things that uh, we really are focused on, and I think it's, it's incumbent on, on groups that do this kind of work, uh, and that is in, in trying to make the most of all of the 
organs and tissues that are donated for research. And part of that uh, is facilitating the use of data that's collected from, from such tissue. Uh, Jess, if you go to the next slide. Um, so to that end, we've been working for several years with uh, a fantastic group of, of investigators and labs, mostly across Canada. Uh, you see listed at the top here, uh, one as well with, with Anna Gloin in the US, um, to uh, generate data from most of the islet preps that we've been uh, doing over the years. Our current algorithm is shown uh, on this slide. Um, I won't go through all of it other than to say that the, the data uh, in the blue uh, is currently in the web tool that Jess is going to talk about while we're collecting much more. So over the, the coming one to two years, uh, the stuff that Jess is, is going to talk about and that she's built uh, is really going to facilitate the use of a lot of data. At least that's our hope. Uh, and the program is going to grow substantially. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Jess, I think this is my last slide and then I'll turn it over. Um, really, you know, our goal is to, to facilitate the use uh, and easy access to data and analysis uh, through that's, that's generated from islets that we've isolated. Uh, we really hope that this will be complementary to other resources that are out there. I mean, Monica mentioned, mentioned a couple at the top. Um, and we really want to promote uh, transparency, usability of the data. Jess will talk a little bit about this. Uh, and if you'd like to become involved with what we're doing, again, please feel free to reach out. Uh, and so that's that. You know, we've been really fortunate to work with uh, Jeff Shaw's group. Uh, I don't think he's on this call. Uh, and particularly with, with Jess, uh, who's, who's going to go through the demo. Uh, uh, who's been really fantastic is now, was at McGill, is now uh, in Boston, uh, and uh, uh, Yao, who is also, I think, on the call, uh, who is now working on this tool. Um, I guess I should also say uh, I'm keeping an eye on uh, the chat, so if you have questions as we go through, please put them in the chat, and I can either answer them or I will interrupt Jess and, and we'll see what we can do there. Uh, so Jess, Maybe I'll hand it off to you. All right, sounds good. Thanks. All right, so all of this data that Pat was talking about that we've collected and we're trying to organize and make accessible, we tried to think about how researchers would want to be querying this data and the types of questions that they would be asking. Uh, and this really informed the whole design of the tool. So we sort of thought people might approach the data from these different perspectives. We might take a systems biology omics view and might broadly ask like what genes and pathways are associated with a specific outcome that forms our omics view. Um, someone might be interested in a specific transcript or protein that they study or that popped up in their analysis. So this page of the tool is fully organized around being able to query a specific feature and pulling up all of the results related to it. And then finally, for the donor view, there might be a specific donor that pops up in your analysis, or perhaps that you've received um, islets from the, the islet core from University of Alberta, and you might want to know how that donor compares to the entire population. So these are the three sort of views or pages that you can see the data through. Um, and I'm going to start by just taking you through a demo of these basic tool features, uh, and then I'll come back to the slides in a little bit. All right, so this is the home page. Like I said, there's the three different views that we can start from. Uh, there's also additional tools to support data download and export, but I'll go over that at the end. Um, and then you can also access these different pages along the side here. So I'll start with the omics view. This really shows all of the data that we've um, organized in this tool. And the whole purpose here is for you to be able to choose an omics type and one of the 74 different metadata or functional outcomes that we've curated and put in this tool. Um, so for example, here, I can select one of these omics types, and I'm gonna start here with this bulk proteomics data. We also have RNA-seq bulk data, a nanostring gene panel that is also bulk. Um, it's for many more donors, although it's a, a limited subset of genes. And then we also have single cell gene expression that's available at both a single cell level and then also at the pseudobulk level. So these are the main data types. So I'm going to leave 
bulk protein expression. Next, we would choose a specific outcome or metadata that we want to look for associations with. So since there's 74, we've put a little bit of effort into grouping them into these different categories uh, to try and make it easier to find what you're looking for. So I'm just going to leave this as the default donor characteristics and then this diagnosis. Um, and since this is a categorical variable, we have the different groups available for you to choose to do the specific comparison. If this were a continuous value like HbA1c, that then disappears. Um, I'm going to ignore this control for section right now. I'll come back to that later. Um, we've also built in here the ability to subset any of the donors by any of our metadata. Um, many more advanced features available here in case you want to filter um, before doing the analysis. And then finally, you can set the p-value cutoff. So when we do this analysis, this tells us how many donors um, were included in the analysis. So this will change if you subset it prior to doing the analysis. And then here we see over 1,500 proteins were differentially abundant um, in donors with type 2 diabetes compared to donors with no diabetes. Uh, so this is first displayed in a graphical summary here where the log fold change is along the bottom. So those with positive values um, have higher levels in donors with type 2 diabetes, and those on the left side with negative values have lower values. And then the y-axis is this negative log 10 p-value. So the higher up it is, the more statistically significant the relationship was. And this is interactive, so you can click this to generate a plot um, of the specific values. And then this is also interactive here, so you can see the specific donor IDs. This is really helpful if you want to, for example, if there's a, a large outlier and you want to investigate it, or if you want to follow up on the ones that have particularly extreme changes. Next, we also have a results table that we've put a lot of work into trying to pack as much information in here as possible without getting being overwhelming. So again, if it's in blue, um, those correspond to these ones on this side. So those are the ones that have lower levels um, in our donors with type 2 diabetes. And if it's in red, it, there's it, it's higher. This is the same interface where if you click one of these rows, you can see the, the plot. Um, and then we've linked out to all of these external databases. So for example, if you click this, it will open um, that genes page in the type 2 diabetes knowledge portal. Um, we also have links to NCBI's gene page. And then one of my favorite parts of this tool is a really large meta-analysis of published single-cell RNA-seq data that uh, Cara Ellis and Pat's lab put together. Uh, and so if you click this, it will show you the cell type specific expression distributions um, in that large meta-analysis that you did. And this was filtered to only include data from non-diabetic donors. Uh, so this will allow you to quickly see what the cell type specific gene expression is. All right, so next I'm going to proceed to the pathway analysis. So this will allow you to do pathway analysis right on the features that you identified as being related to the metadata that you selected. Um, we have two different types, overrepresentation analysis, so this is where we take our list of significant features and we compare it to a library of predefined gene sets. And we look for statistically significant overlaps between our list of perturbed features and this gene set library. Um, on the other hand, GSEA looks at the entire ranked list, so not just the ones that pass the thresholds. Um, and you can rank it by either the log two fold change um, or the T statistic from the analysis. And what this is doing is it's just seeing if any of these gene sets are sort of statistically significantly concentrated on usually the, the higher end or the lower end of the list. And so this can be a really good approach if, the, um, if you have a lower number of significant features, but you still want to look for subtle pathway effects. All right, and then we have curated a number of different gene set libraries that are all available for analysis in here. I'm going to leave it as KEG for now and just perform this analysis. All right, so here we can see, again, we're looking at proteins that were have differentially abundant levels in donors with type two diabetes and donors without. And then we've analyzed that list um, using overrepresentation analysis with the KEG database. And so this um, resulted in 20 significant gene sets. 
By default, we show all of the significant ones, um, but you can update this and it will always just take the 10 top or the 30 top if you wanted to increase it. Um, these along the x-axis here um, is the feature level log two fold change of every single feature that's in that pathway, not just the significant ones. And they're sorted from low to high. So the interpretation here would be that this is the pathway that was um, had the, the lowest levels um, in donors with type 2 diabetes, where this is a pathway that generally had higher levels in donors with type 2 diabetes. So you can also click these, and this will generate a pathway with all of the feature level results. Um, here we've shown every single gene or protein that's in that pathway. Uh, not just the significant ones, but if it had been flagged as statistically significantly different in our analysis, it will have these little stars beside it. We always put the metadata that you used for the analysis at the top, and we sort the data by those metadata. Um, and so this allows us to see, for example, these are the donors that have type 2 diabetes in the analysis, and, and this group of um, proteins seems to have increased abundance in these, in these donors. So this can give you sort of a more fine-grained picture of what's happening at the pathway level. Um, we've also just made it really easy to sort of adjust a view of this. Um, and then all of this information is available in the results table. All right. So now I'm going to... Um, just before I, I leave and go to the next page, uh, I just want to highlight some things like, like Pat said that we've done towards reproducibility here. Um, if I click this button here, I'll get a CSV file of exactly the results um, in this table. And there's the same uh, option available for the pathway results. But then this button is really cool. If you click this, it'll take a little while to generate. Um, but it's actually going to create a zip folder that's timestamped with the date that you did the analysis. And it's going to have exactly the input data that was used for any of the analysis that you did. So after filtering, for example. Um, so that this is all this, this input data here, including all of the genes that were used for the, the gene set or for the, the pathway analysis. Then there's also going to be a copy of every single R function that was used in the tool. And then there's going to be a file here that shows you um, every single function that was called and the parameters that were used. And the reason why we developed this feature is because we found it's very common with web-based tools where we are constantly pushing updates um, and we're adding new data. And of course, we document that and make that available in the updates tab. But it's not very helpful if you're somebody who's used a tool like this to do an analysis or grab some data and you submit a paper for publication and then review comes around six months later and you can no longer trace back. So by making this um, feature, by building this feature, we are trying to give you a fully controlled local kind of containerized version of any results that you get through this tool. So hopefully that makes this all more reproducible. Um, and then in addition, we also have um, every single function um, that's used in the web tool available on this GitHub. Um, and we also have all of the scripts that were used to process all of the data before it was included in the tool. So I just wanted to highlight that. All right, so I've showed you how to do the overall omics view. Um, Another thing that people are commonly interested in is they might want to look at a specific feature. So if I had a specific gene that I cared about uh, and I wanted to know what it's doing across the protein data, the gene expression data, everything, I'd have to manually go through and look at every single one and then possibly flip through many of these different outcomes. That would take a long time. Um, so we pre-computed every single possible analysis that you would want to do and then indexed it all nicely in a database. This has over 4 million relationships. Um, and if you go to the feature view, you can quickly search those. So for example, um, I could pull up this, search it by the, the gene name, um, and then this will display um, any protein or transcript associated with this gene. Um, across all of the different omics types and then all of the different metadata. And this is sorted by the adjusted p-value. 
And so this allows you to see kind of everything in one place. Um, and again, for example, I, I can click all of this right here. Um, so I can bring up those plots. Uh, and then we also have those same external links and the ability to download your search results. You can also search this by the metadata outcome. So for example, if I wanted, I, I can search this um, by metadata outcome as well. All right. Um, finally, the last main page that I'll show you is the donor view. So in this one, um, we allow you to search by a specific donor ID, and then you can pull up all of the um, specific metadata values for that donor projected across the distribution of values that are in the population um, for all the different data types. So here's here, on this first page are just the main ones that people usually care about. And I wanted to highlight right here, we have the inventory. So this tells you um, what, um, samples are available. I, I Pat can give you more details on this, but I, I believe that these are samples that you might be able to get access to if you were doing your own studies. Um, then you can see we have a ton of information um, on the, iso the, the technical islet isolation. So you can flip through and this one was really bad. <laughs> it has really low purity, um, but you'd be able to easily see that here. We also have images. I didn't choose this donor. This one just popped up. Um, maybe I'll go to a different one. Okay, this one's better. Um, and then we also have all of the, the functional data. This one is one of my favorite ones. It's dynamic insulin response to these different macronutrients. Um, so this is a response to glucose and other macronutrients over time. Uh, and you can see this donor in black highlighted against all of the other ones. You can also show this normalized to the glucose baseline. Um, through this interface, you can also see the mitochondrial function or the, the seahorse data. This data type isn't available for this donor. It's mainly for the more recent ones, um, but you can still, still see the data here. And then we have the single cell function, so the electrophysiology outcomes, which are collected at the single cell level for different cell types and after different glucose concentration exposures. And then finally, there's a page with um, the omics overview. So this one will show you for this donor which omics data types are available. All right, so finally, now that I've shown you these three basic pages um, and what they can do, I wanted to just highlight the effort that we went through to link all of these together. So a lot of the times when I'm doing an analysis, you know, I might find something that I find really interesting and maybe there's a big outlier. So this isn't really an outlier, but this one has the highest value here. So if I, this is, um, you know, uh, the donor specific protein levels of, of this gene. Um, and so I can go and see this one and click it. And then this will open the donor view page for, for this donor. And so then I can look at this uh, in more detail. And then we can do the same thing um, on the results table page. If you click these linked values right here, it will open the feature view um, with that, that gene searched. And so we've tried to make it really easy for people to do analyses, generate hypotheses, and then um, kind of quickly follow up on it by, by querying different parts of the tool. All right. so. Last, um, I'm going to start talking a, a little bit more about this control for, uh, but just to motivate this, I want to show you some examples of associations in the database. So one of the things that we've stressed about this tool is the effort that we went into making all of these technical outcomes available, things related to the organ characteristics and processing, the isolation outcomes, cell culture outcomes. These are things that sometimes are available on data that you get publicly, but not always. And we found that some of them really, really matter. So one example, this was the, the metadata that have the most associations in the whole data set. Um, when we look at culture time, particularly with the gene expression data, you can see an extremely strong and 
statistically significant relationship between culture time and gene expression. So I just want to show you that. And then another one that we see is between all of the omics actually, and then this islet purity. All right, so now I'm going to go back to the slides to just talk about this a little bit more. Okay. Um, maybe before I go back to the slides, Pat, were there any questions for me to answer about the interface before I go back into slides? Not in the chat. Um, I put a few little bits of info in there for people to, to have a look at. Um, but I guess we could ask anyone if there's any questions they want to ask now before you go on. Oh, there's a question just popped up in the chat. Uh, can you please explain the difference between the bulk and pseudo bulk sequencing? Sure. So the, the, the bulk sequencing is just kind of your standard RNA sequencing or proteomics data where um, the, the sequencing was just done on the bulk tissue. Um, then we also have single cell RNA seq samples for a number of these donors. And so we do make that available at the single cell level um, because Pat's group has also collected single cell electrophysiology outcomes for all of those cells. So that's a really fine grained and cool analysis that you can do. Um, but then if you want to do comparisons to all of our donor level outcomes, we've generated pseudo bulk um, profiles, which just means like if you have 50 alpha cells from one donor, we're going to sum all of the counts to create one pseudo bulk alpha cell profile. Um, so this gives you a single measure of gene expression um, for that donor instead of all 50 across all cells. And then this allows you to analyze this, you know, across all of our different metadata. Uh, the reason for doing this, there's like lots of de debate about whether it's better to take a pseudo bulk um, approach to look for associations between donors and single cell RNA seq data, or whether you should use like a mixed model where you're um, just accounting for the donor as a random effect. Uh, but in this tool, just because of feasibility feasibility issues with a, a web hosted service, uh, this approach is just much more computationally efficient. And there was one other question, although I think that you're going to probably touch on it when you talk about the, the proteomics deconvolution. But the question was, how do we interrogate gene expression in specific cell types? Um, but I think one way to do that would be to look at you know, associations with your cell type specific analysis. So I don't know if you want to comment on that now, Jess, or just keep it in mind as we go forward. Yeah, well, maybe like I will talk about the deconvolution analysis approach more. I mean, one way would be to look at the single cell um, gene expression, which we have for alpha cells and beta cells at either the actual single cell or the pseudobulk level. Um, there's also um, just kind of for interpretation, the ability to look at the single cell gene expression distribution in this external meta-analysis that we have here. Um, and then, yeah, I'll leave the, the third way to my slides because I'm about to go talk about that in more detail. Yeah, I think the third way is the coolest way. <laughs> okay, I will go back to the slides then. Okay. All right, so I talked about um, how we have some of these technical covariates have extremely strong relationships with the omics data. Um, so I wanted to, like, those are things that we probably want to account for in some way, and I just wanted to take a step back and kind of review the basics of how we analyze omics data, um, just because I know that this is a thing, even though a lot of us do this all the time, we might not always get to the details of this. So it's standard practice at this point to use linear models for analyzing omics data, and the, the what we're doing is we're, we're fitting a linear model to the expression of each gene or to the levels of each protein, one at a time. And in each of these cases, what we're asking is if, for example, if we're looking at transcriptomics data, is the expression of gene A explained by metadata outcome X? Um, so here's an example that I pulled. Um, this is not a diabetes related data set, but just to illustrate, um, in this example, I'm taking one gene here. This corresponds to the, the Y values in any regression equation that we're doing. I'm looking to see if the expression of this gene can be explained by treatment, like chemical exposure, um, and potentially sex. So that would just mean fitting a linear model where we're going to 
find coefficients that explain the relationship between each of these variables and gene expression. So the way we've set up the tools, we have this metadata of interest, and then we have all of these things that we're controlling for. That just means that each of these get included in the analysis. And then the results that we return is we're just looking at the coefficient of the metadata that we've specified that we're interested in. Um, and we're taking like the coefficient or log full change, depending if it's categorical or continuous, the T statistic and the P value, um, and then returning that for um, all of the genes or all the proteins. Um, so when we say control for covariates, all we mean is add it to the model. In this case, we're modeling everything as fixed effects. You can get really complicated with this and make all of these um, really perfectly specified models. To keep things simple in the tool, we're just sort of doing the, the basic fixed effect modeling. All right, so what does this actually mean for the, the things that I showed you? If we focus on culture time, um, like I said, this had an extremely strong association with transcripts, uh, but interestingly, not proteins, uh, which there's a biological explanation there that I'm not sure what it is, but I think it's really interesting. Um, and if you look at, for example, this is these are what the, the relationships look like. Here's one gene, um, fibroblast growth factor two in the RNA-seq nanostring and proteomics data. You can see a strong relationship for the transcripts, but not the proteins. Um, and I just wanted to point out, it's kind of interesting, the, the, the points cluster into these four different groups. If you look at the x-axis and you see the hours, you'll see that these correspond to like the, the different work days. Um, and this is just determined by sometimes these um, islets arrive uh, maybe on like a Friday or on a long weekend or something. So that's why you have like a maximum sort of a four days before they get fully processed. So that's what, what is explaining that spread there. Okay, so like I said, since this is determined by when the islet or when when the samples actually arrive at University of Alberta, the culture time is completely random with respect to all of the other metadata in the human islets database. This is sort of the dream scenario for statisticians because it means that we can control for it without worrying about confounding effects at all. So what we would do in the tool is just add it to that um, to control for it using that second drop down. Um, and when we do this, this improves the statistical significance for nearly every analysis that we've done. Um, so this is a visual representation of that. On the x axis, I'm showing you the negative log 10 p value for every single transcript um, with just a simple analysis comparing um, type 2 diabetes to no diabetes uh, with no covariate adjustment. And then on the y-axis, this is showing you how the p-values change um, when you add culture time. And so this black line is the one-to-one -one line, and anything above it um, is a, a transcript for which the statistical significance increased after controlling for culture time, and below would be where it decreased. So in general, we're seeing a big decrease, and then all of these points in red right here are transcripts that did not pass the statistic the significance threshold without controlling, but they did when we did control for it. So the takeaway from this is that I think it's a really good idea for people to think about culture time if they're analyzing transcriptomics data um, and maybe something to consider for any of the future analyses that you do. All right, so that's a simple case. Um, Omics associations with islet purity is much more difficult to kind of disentangle and deal with. So we found many features, both transcripts and proteins that were associated with islet purity. Now, islet purity is also associated with diabetes status. So in general, the further along the diabetes um, disease progression you go, the harder the islets become to isolate and the lower the purity is. Um, so originally we thought, you know, maybe this is just sort of an indirect relationship. There's something about these islets that's causing the donors to have diabetes, and it's also causing the donors to have lower islet purity. Um, and since all of the islets are handpicked before we do omics analysis, um, perhaps this is just sort of um, a coincidental relationship. Jess, can you um, quantify that that is um, the same for both type 1 and type 2 diabetes, that this purity issue um, exists? Yes, maybe Pat can comment on that more specifically, but I'd say yes, that's that's the same relationship there. Okay. Yeah, I mean, even more so in type one. Uh, to be to be 
honest or not not honest but uh, i mean the way we process type one pancreas we actually don't bother purifying uh so yeah they're extremely impure um you can get islets in in type one diabetes uh but uh we don't bother running them through the density density gradient purification okay great thanks for that yeah Okay, so at first, since like the hand picking is done before we analyze the omics data or before we collect the omics data, we thought maybe this is just a coincidental relationship. However, um, the relationship with purity is very strong, like stronger than any of the diabetes metadata. And also the top associated features have super biased expression in either endocrine or non-endocrine cell types specifically. So for example, here's one of the ones most associated with purity and it has extremely biased expression in this acinar and ductal cell types. Um, so then our hypothesis was kind of purity as an indirect measure of the number of non-endocrine cells that remain trapped on the surface of these islets even after hand picking. And so um, perhaps percent purity is sort of an indirect measure of this non-endocrine cell type composition. So we maybe don't want to just directly control for percent purity because it's sort of a crude measurement of this. And maybe there's a better way of approaching this problem. Maybe we can more accurately um, estimate the percentage of non-endocrine cells. And so we did this with something called cell type deconvolution analysis. So this is where um, you try to estimate the proportion of different cell types that made up each sample based on a bulk omics profile. So either the transcriptomics or the proteomics. So the general way that we do this is to take um, marker genes for the main endocrine cell types. So here we focused on alpha, beta, delta, and gamma cells. And we used marker genes from this meta-analysis that was published um, where they, they look, tried to identify genes that are only expressed um, in, in one of these cell types or in one or two of these cell types. So we filtered this to look at only ones that were expressed in the single cell type. And then we use them to kind of calculate a consensus signal strength for each cell type based on all of the marker genes in each, in each sample. So you'd imagine we get like a signal score for alpha cells, for beta cells, for delta cells, and for gamma cells within each sample. Um, then, and this is a really great benefit of the human islets database, since it's really representative of the broad population, and we have such a relatively high number of samples, we used our prior knowledge of islet cell type proportions in, in studies that had been published to kind of translate this specific cell types signal into an estimated proportion. So just for an example, if like it, according to prior knowledge, we know that roughly 30% of cell type X are in the population, we would use that to kind of sh convert this cell type signal into an estimated proportion. And then finally, we estimated this non-endocrine cell type signal, which is an umbrella term for any cell type that's not one of these four major ones, um, as just one minus the sum of all of the estimated endocrine proportions. And so this allows and allows us to get, using some pretty simple methods, uh, just a rough estimation of these different cell types with uh, exocrine here being an umbrella term for multiple. This gives us some results like this, um, where along the x-axis here are different donor IDs. Um, and then along the y-axis are the percentages or the proportions of the different estimated cell point cell types. Um, and to kind of evaluate this, we did a few things with our data. First, we we used the proteomics data for this analysis. And the reason for that was because our other omics data had many batches that were combined together. And so the batch effects made it difficult to do this analysis in a in a robust way. Um, and but then we we then had these proportions that we could go and look for associations in other omics data types that were not used for the analysis. And when we do this, for example, we look for the association between these estimated cell type proportions and gene expression in the RNA sequencing data. And then we look at the external single cell meta-analysis cell type distributions. We very clearly saw that all of these transcripts that were associated, for example, with beta cells had very specific uh, uh, beta cell biased distributions in the single cell data. And then uh, we did this at like excluding the marker genes that were used for the analysis. And then even more convincing, I think we saw extremely strong um, associations between the estimated non-endocrine proportion and many, many um, genes or transcripts and proteins that were in like acinar and ductal cells. 
And that's particularly convincing because we didn't use any non-endocrine marker genes in the analysis. It's, it's that leftover signal. So we took that as evidence to say that this is working pretty well. And you can see some of these associations are extremely strong. All right. So now if we use um, this estimated non-endocrine cell proportion and we adjust for this instead of just the percent purity, um, this does, as we expect, <laughs> generally bring down the number of significant features for many of these metadata outcomes that are associated with diabetes status. Uh, and this is expected because, again, like, like we said, our ability to fully kind of isolate these islets is somehow related uh, to the diabetes status. Um, however, in this analysis, like you can see that some transcripts or proteins are more corrected than others. Um, some of them actually increase in significance after you correct for them. And if you look at the list before and after accounting for the non-endocrine cell types, you see that it successfully filters out many of these features that have extremely biased expression in non-endocrine versus endocrine um, cell types. And so um, the way that I would approach results like this, I wouldn't discount any features that are no longer significant after adjusting for these things. I would just maybe prioritize more highly the ones that are still significant after performing these kind of corrections, or at least to consider these sort of results when you're interpreting all of the data. All right, so next, I was just going to go and show how you can do this in the tool. Um, so I'll perhaps go back to RNA-seq. Go back here. This is as simple as this um, to include culture time in the analysis. I can also easily include other um, covariates. For example, like people often will adjust for age, BMI, things like this. And now all of these results will be um, after accounting for those covariates. Uh, we can do the same for the non-endocrine proportion. Um, then I did just want to show, as Pat was saying, like a cell type specific analysis. I wanted to show how you can analyze that data as well. Uh, you can go to the cell proportions for the metadata and select the type. And this will pull up um, all of the features that are associated with the estimated proportion of non-endocrine cell types. You can see there's a lot here. And if you look at them, the relationship looks quite convincing and significant. You can see this in the results table as well. Because this effect is so strong, when I'm looking at the associations with other cell types, uh, I like to still adjust for the non-endocrine proportion while I'm doing this analysis. So on the other hand, when we analyze the bulk data with respect to the beta cell proportion, um, first of all, I'd say when I'm looking for associations between the cell type proportion and the omics, I like to focus on the, the positively associated ones because that just has a more natural interpretation in my mind. <laughs> it usually just means like that's a cell type specific one. So if I look at for example, the single cell distribution. Um, you see this is very strong in the in the beta cell here. And again, not like the majority of these genes were not used as the marker genes. There is quite an overlap of the beta, um, or sorry, th there is a bit more overlap with the delta here. And then if I were to switch to alpha cells, Can see here, this is pretty strongly present in the alpha cells. All right, so there was that question earlier about how to look at sort of cell type expression patterns, even if you're using the bulk data. So one way I find it really interesting to just explore these associations. Um, one reason is that, you know, single cell RNA-seq will give you a lot of this information. Um, however, single cell RNA-seq has a really high dropout rate. 
So it's really focusing on these genes that have really high expression levels in these different cell types. And you often are only able to quantify, you know, the, the, the top like 25 percentile of the most highly expressed genes with confidence. Um, and so I think this approach is interesting because we're able to pick up on um, features that have cell type associations with these estimated cell type proportions, but they might have much lower um, expression levels. So it allows you to kind of probe deeper down um, into those profiles. Um, then the other thing that you can do is um, include these in interesting ways as covariates in your analysis. For example, if we're looking at the bulk protein data, and I will look at this dynamic insulin response to macronutrients. And for example, maybe this uh, glucose stimulated secretion. If I do this just on my own, you know, I get a whole bunch of features. So these are proteins that are associated with insulin secretion after exposure to glucose. If I adjust for this, the number goes way down. But for me, trying to interpret these results, I actually find it helpful. <laughs> I feel it kind of prioritizes ones that are more worthwhile to follow up on, um, but um, is something to, to think about. Then you could also, for example, control for um, the beta cell proportion. So, if you just like think about why somebody might have a really strong um, response to glucose, you, you can just start to think about this in kind of more interesting ways, you know, like after con controlling for the proportion of beta cells in these islets are, are some still better than others at secreting insulin. So anyways, these are the kinds of more complicated analyses that you can do afterwards. All right, so that's all that I'm going to show there, but I have to show you before I wrap up the demo, um, the data download page, because this shows you how you can get all of the data out of the tool. Uh, so we have this organized into two ways. The one on the left, the first step is to first select the donors for which you'd like data from. So if you want all of it, you can just click submit and it will just not filter out any. You can remove, so maybe you really want to look at donors with type 1 diabetes. You could exclude those with type 2 here. We also have many more advanced features that you can look at here. You can filter by all of these technical parameters. And then maybe especially interesting inventory, like the ones that are actually available to be requested from the ILIC core. Um, so let's just say I'm going to... Uh, Maybe I'll maybe I have specific age requirements and I want to filter by. Um, actually, we can also filter by data availability. So maybe you know that you want to download specific data types. Maybe you want to look at the static insulin secretion in the RNA seq, for example. And so this will bring out um, only donors that pass the age criteria that have both of these data types. You can download the donor list. And then again, you can also download uh, by a list of donor IDs. And then here you can select all of the data types that you might want and the format that you'd like them in. And then you can download them here. So we'll take just a few seconds to export. Um, Okay, and so you can see here, we always include the donor information. So this is all the basic metadata like age, sex, diabetes status. I had selected the insulin secretion data, so that's available here. And then for all of the omics data, we make it available in both what we call processed and unprocessed. So the, the raw data is not available here, like the raw sequencing or the raw protein intensity data. Um, but this would be the most minimally processed, like the first quantitative table. So in this case, this is the counts. Um, and then the, the process data is after we performed all of the processing. Um, so what's actually used in the analysis in the tool. So this would be after missing value imputation, batch correction, normalization, and filtering. Um, so, you know, if you want to quickly use some cleaned data that's ready to go, you can use this. And if you want to do your more advanced analyses, with your own pipeline, you can use this. All right, so 
Finally, I also wanted to show you that um, we put a lot of work into trying to document everything as well as possible. So we have a whole uh, like manual here with overviews of all of the different data types, brief and brief details of the experiment, um, the omics data types as well, as well as links to kind of where you can find more information, as well as an overview of all the statistical methods, including the specific R packages and their versions, um, and links to, to papers that provide more details. Uh, and then we also have a tutorial that has many different screenshots um, with lots of details on the interface and tips and tricks for how to use it. Okay, um, that was all that I had for the demo. So I can go back to the slides, but I also see that there's like 18 messages in the chat. So I don't know if there's anything to talk about before we go to the final uh, slide to wrap up. I don't think there's anything further in the chat. Some of those messages are for me. Okay. Uh, Monica says there will be uh, a, uh, a video or recording of this available along with many others. Um, yeah, and I've answered a couple of questions as well. Okay. I, I had a couple of questions for you guys. Um, first of all, this is just an amazing resource. Uh, it, it's, it's phenomenal. It's so, it, it, the way it's organized and the way um, it has such really great UX, UI, it's really uh, superlative. So congratulations on putting it together. Um, I had a question for you though. I had a couple questions. How does this amazing resource play with Pank Base and NPOD and European resources? Um, is there an opportunity there um, for people to kind of use them in concert or what are your thoughts on it? Um, I, I don't know if you want to comment on that, Jess. I mean, you might know some of the technical issues with, for example, bringing other uh, data sets uh, into the tool. You know, uh, I think Jess has built this uh, to be quite flexible. So in a sense, other data sets uh, could be brought in from other sources. Um, before I go on, on some other thoughts on this, Jess, do you, do you want to comment on that? Like, what if, what if someone from another program, another place in the world wants to use this kind of framework? Yeah, I mean, I asked that because, you know, we built a T1D TCR BCR genetic data repo as a community build. We, we aligned with the air data commons and the eye receptor as sort of like the onboarding capacity. And uh, sort of one by one, we're having people bring their data sets in and get it standardized and harmonized so it's all there together. And so I, I just looking at what you've built here, it seems like, wouldn't that be wouldn't that be great if you could do that? I just don't know if it's you know even possible. Yeah, I can comment on some of the technical stuff there. So um, for example, like to some extent, we've already sort of done that with the RNA-seq data. So this is all from islets that were isolated in the University of Alberta, um, but there's like 15 different batches included here that were collected in different countries across different time points and even just different sequencing machines. Um, and so like, the noise is higher when you're integrating data from such diverse sources. Mm -hmm. um, for sample size increasing is also really powerful though. Um, so like in some sense, integrating really diverse data sets is possible. You'll just notice a bit noisier results maybe in your relationships. Um, but then the slightly more difficult thing is that, um, you know, I have a little bit of experience with trying to download data sets that are publicly available. And often there's only like three or four metadata that are available with those data sets. Mm -hmm. um, and so of course, if metadata like diabetes status was available, um, that could be included, but like most of these things you would not be able to look at in those samples. Um, and then, like I said, since integrating such diverse data sources together has its own challenges, I, I could see perhaps like a, bulk gene expression RNA-seq meta-analysis, like a new category, you know, where we brought together really diverse data sources into one massive um, data set that you can then analyze with this tool. And it would only have a few metadata and, you know, there would be challenges, but yeah, that's that's a way forward I could see. Yeah, I mean, you can imagine some industry has some of these bulk seq, um, you know, sets yeah. that would be pertinent to type one and type two that might be, interesting to somehow get a hold of and, and on board if they fit, I guess. 
Yeah. And then maybe before I let Pat take over, I'll just do a quick plug for this tool, which is another one that I developed during my PhD with other members of the Shia lab. Um, and this is one um, for gene expression and also proteomics data. And this is where a lot of our interface came from. Um, mm -hmm. So this is one where people can actually upload their own data sets. And we have a ton of protocols and tutorials for how to use this tool. So this is like a general tool for the life scientist. Whereas this one is like really carefully designed around the specific data set that we have for like querying and visualizing it. So um, just wanted to point this out for folks if they have data sets that they want to analyze with a similar framework. Um, yeah, although this right. has more diabetes specific tools and features. That's great. Um, how, how might these data and this resource basically interface with the uh, MLAI to generate novel models? Um, Pat, is that something, oh, ML and AI. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I wasn't sure if that was a new consortium I hadn't heard of yet. <laughs> no, no, sorry. Yeah. No, I think, um, so for example, that deconvolution analysis that I did, that was a really basic and simple approach, mm -hmm. partially because like we have 540 donors here, not all of which have omics data, which is an increasing number. Um, but that's still a sample size where I think our basic linear models are kind of the most robust. Um, but as these numbers continue to increase more and more, um, then I think we start to get into the range where these more complicated models, we start to have the sample size to support them. And that deconvolution analysis specifically, I think that's a really interesting open air area for continued research of how can we make these cell type estimates more precise. Um, Right, and that leads me to our other question. What's the distribution of the type one versus type two data that you've got right now? And where do you see it going? Are you gonna to try to build in one direction or another or are you agnostic? So I think- um, I'll let Pat talk about this. <laughs> sure, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we want to be able to study more of both types and uncommon types of, of diabetes as well. Um, the, the sort of the underlying um, philosophy of this tool has been to look at variation across all the islet preps, whether that be in, in non-diabetes type one or type two. Um, you know, there is an appetite, I think, from us and the scientific community to study more type one and type two donors. We're working on some approaches to try and increase uh, our um, uh, ability to, to provide those to the community. Uh, hopefully we'll know more about that in the next year or so. Um, you know, but of course, for this kind of tool, we want more of each. Uh, I think there are 15 type one donors in this at the moment and something, there's quite a few type twos. So something like almost, I can't, I don't want to quote the number offhand, but oh, if we talk about pre type twos, oh, you've got them in there. Oh, this the is a percent. Two. It's yeah. not an absolute number, but. Yeah, so we're getting up to a little less than 100 type twos. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that answers your question, um, but uh, you know, we definitely are underrepresented in those. Um, and so like, as you build this, as this continues to build, which I'm sure you know it's going to, um, can you, like how might you incentivize people who have sort of tissue, I mean, could you say say to the community at large, hey, this is, we've got this, and if you'd love to um, contribute, could, what are the parameters you need to, to give us? Yeah, so we're very interested in having uh, ch uh, discussions with anyone who would like to contribute to this kind of initiative, whether it be through the phenotyping islets that we produce, which I think we're well set up to do now, um, I think that uh, in order to, to do that, we have to, you know, have assays that we can uh, do on a substantial number of donors and preps. Um, you know, a lot of the work that we support through the, the biobank, you know, they're experimental studies where people use five or six donors for an experiment, but that's not really what this tool is set up for. We really need to be able to assess many different donors. Um, as for bringing in data from other tissue sources, which I think is what you're implying, um, yeah. you know, it's something we've really talked much about. Um, I think it'd be very interesting to 
discuss. Uh, there are other uh, efforts uh, underway, notably uh, uh, the pank base effort, which mm -hmm. we are uh, peripherally connected to in a way. We have you know, been been talking with them and it are part of those discussions. So that really is, uh, you know, an effort to bring data sets from disparate sources together. So I think fundamentally, we need to think a little bit about what we want our tool to be, you know, whether it's, um, you know, just to look at the data produced from pilots here, or whether, you know, we can bring in other 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 things. You know, we've talked about bringing in uh, characterization of stem cell derived beta cells, for example, yeah. for comparison to primary islets. Um, I think, you know, another way to think about it would be whether the tools that Jess and the She Lab has, has developed, um, whether those can be used with other data sets. It doesn't have to necessarily be on our tool that we've shown you here today. Yeah, no, I that's exactly what I was thinking about. It's, you've got the, you know, the control, the T1, the T2, and I thought of the human, the HSC, you know, right. as a third button, a fourth, yeah, third, fourth button right there. So, cause that would be so interesting to see how, you know, under your, under your parameters here, how that, how those, um, those cells, you know, behave. Yeah. I mean, our immediate focus is on um, increasing the amount, number of data sets and donors in the tool. So, I mean, I can tell yeah. you we have, so that RNA-seq is about 120 donors. We have somewhere between two and 300 more donors coming into the tool um, within the next several months or so. Uh, you know, genetics and, and genomics, I, well, Jess has it up here, environmental contaminants we're measuring from every donor, pancreas now, metabolomics, which actually Jess's former lab is, is doing uh, and imaging and so on. Um, so that's, that's really sort of our most immediate focus, but as always happy to talk with anyone interested to discuss this stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, thank you again. You have a lot of accolades in the chat, great resource, congrats, et cetera, et cetera. I and mean, this is just phenomenal. It's, it's really, really a beautiful new resource. And, um, we, uh, we'll share this as soon as we, you know, edit and get it up probably next week on our website. So those who haven't been able to attend due to time constraints or whatever can, can always re uh, access it there. Um, thank you both and your teams again to, for this, uh, fabulous resource. And, uh, I hope, uh, uh, I hope to see, or we'll definitely be keeping an eye on the progress and, um, you know, we'll hope to see you again uh, in 2025 and, and get an update. Great. Thank you. And thanks to everyone who showed up in the, in the middle of July. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a lot of people did. So thank you. Thanks again. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye now. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you.